Okay. Alexis. <laughs> we just got out of Megan. What are your thoughts? 10 out of 10. She accomplished a lot. Megan didn't let anything stand in her way. <laughs> I'll say that much. Hey, everyone. You're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce, and me and my producer, Alexis Williams, used our lunch break last week to go see the movie everyone is talking about, Megan. There was camp, there was horror, there was comedy, there was family. There are a few scenes where literally Brittany and I like jumped up out of the seat. <laughs> like, what? You should probably run. So we know Megan is scary, but what's the movie actually about? The film centers on a toy creator named Gemma, who becomes a guardian to her recently orphaned niece. To make her adjustment to parenting easier and to give her niece a new friend, Gemma invents Megan, an AI robot toy in the form of a life-sized doll. And as you might imagine, murder ensues. And audiences, including me, have been eating it up. This tweet from Rohita Kadambi sums up how much of a hit this movie is. Domestic box office of $30 million on a $12 million budget? 94% on Rotten Tomatoes? Sequel in development? Megan is the industry. And queer people have been claiming this murderous blonde doll as their own. She looks like Elizabeth Olsen slash Amanda Seyfried. And she's very pretty and she's like a little bit psychotic and mean. And you're just like, I don't know it for other people, but I was like, I'm in love. The Megan Oscar campaign starts today. <laughs> That's Alex Abad Santos. He wrote a piece for Vox about Megan's queer appeal. In some ways, do you think that like Megan had like a righteous vengeance or like that she was right to attack in some way? Well, there's that Lady Gaga quote that's like, I don't believe in the glorification of murder, but I believe in the empowerment of women. <laughs> Today on the show, we're making the argument for why Megan belongs in the queer canon after a quick break. Alex, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Thanks for having me. We've been so excited for this conversation all week. You don't even know. Perfect. Anytime I can talk about Megan or M3 again, I am <laughs> very, very happy. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what did you initially think the film was going to be about? I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? It's Allison Williams, famous Nepo baby <laughs> from Girls, Get Out, The Perfection. And she basically invents a doll that like seems to kill people. There's no bait and switch here. Like it's like <laughs> there's like maybe like a little tweak about like how it's about AI and how it's about parenting and maybe it's about screen time. But like what you get is a pretty killer doll that dances that's very cute but also kind of mean. You know, you you mentioned that you are actually not a horror fan. What made you want to see the movie? Was it just Megan's charms alone? One, I'm a flagrant homosexual. So anything that is involves a pretty woman who's kind of mean and kind of very awful. I, there's something in my little brain that's like, yes, I love this. I love Chicago. I love anything that any woman that kind of like is into murder a little bit, I'm very into. <laughs> so I think that is what drew me to it. I think there's like a bigger trend here, right? Of mm -hmm. like a lot of these horror movies that are coming out, like Barbarian, even Malignant, or even if you go back to like Ma, there's like this sense of camp about them. And it's just, mm. for me, I'm just like, well, I am like, I can't watch The Exorcist. I can't watch Poltergeist. All that stuff freaks me out. But I was just like, in these movies, because you're like a little bit removed from it and you can kind of make fun of it and laugh at it. Mm. That's what I love. I mean, to your point, like, it wasn't just you. You also noticed th this trend, which has been discussed online, speaking specifically to like Megan's queer appeal. Mm -hmm. What else do you think gives Megan the makings of a queer icon? Because yeah. you were one of the first people to call this, I feel like, on the internet and really stake that claim. I mean, please, I'm terminally online. So please. <laughs> <laughs> so that is not a compliment by any means. I'm just online a lot. <laughs> I wrote an article about this and I like spoke to like a queer scholar who was like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of overlap between like gay people and queer people love horror movies. When you peel that back and you're like, well, why? And it's just like, well, at the basis of it, right, is like every horror movie is about startling and something frightening the status quo. Mm. It's something about like normal life that kind of gets shaken up and there's an affinity to that. 
for a lot of queer people, like normal life is is kind of a horror show, right? Like it's a little bit like you feel mm. trapped and it just doesn't feel right. A lot of those themes interweave with horror. With Megan, I think the camp appeal is that it's a doll. And, <laughs> and I asked and I was like, because I really needed to know. I was like, I don't know why I love this movie so much. And this this guy named Joe, Joe Valesi, mm-hmm. he's a professor at NYU. And he was like, well, I think a lot of it is for gay men, especially in queer men, there's a lot of like binary, right? It's like boys are supposed to act one way, girls are supposed to act the other way. And it's like, you can't be pretty, you can't be beautiful, you can't be like soft if you're a boy, right? And it's so and they're just like, don't play with dolls. And then he was like, Mm. I think there's probably some of that there. And I'm like, yeah, I think so. Like if it's this pretty Barbie that kills people, (laughs) right? (laughs) the action figures are supposed to be killing people. Polly Pocket's not supposed to kill people. (laughs) Barbie's not supposed to kill people. And so I think that the displacing of expectation is what triggered this kind of outpouring of affection for this murder doll. (laughs) Because it's just like you don't really see a murder doll every day. So you've been thinking about this for a while. You Mm -hmm. talked to an expert about Megan's queer appeal before seeing the film. Now that you've seen it, does she still hold up? It, it's so much gayer. You saw it. Like, <laughs> it's so much gayer. I think the, one of the recurring jokes on the internet is Megan has a lot more LGBTQ appeal than a movie like Bros, which was the famous, well, infamous rom-com that came out right, last right. year. <laughs> there was this whole campaign for all these people to watch Bros because they were just like, we need queer, queer love stories. Right, 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 right. According to Billy Eichner, it was the first... Of its kind. (laughs) Right. It was like, here's a studio rom-com. And it was just like, it's gay rights if you go see this movie. And then it was just like, (laughs) it kind of did not live up to box office expectations. And for gay people, this murder doll movie comes around. Everyone loves it. There's like a couple good trailers. There's like this really cute troop of dancers dressed like Megan. And they're showing up in like Times Square. They're showing up at football games and they're doing a little dance. But like other than that, there's <laughs> there was no real like, hey, gay people, this is an important movie for you to see. Right. Yet there's this exponential outpouring of affection for the gay murder doll. Like now it's a gay murder doll. We, it, it's part of our community. <laughs> Megan is our community. We are going to support this, this murder doll to a $30 million domestic box office, which is insane because the movie reportedly cost $12 million to make. Wow. I wonder, like, you say that Megan actually ended up being gayer than you thought when you saw the movie. Like, what makes it gayer <laughs> than you thought it would be? I mean, spoiler alert, there's two musical numbers. Megan sings. And you're she just like... <laughs> she sings a hit. I don't want to say what hit it is, but she sings a hit. Yeah, she sings a hit, but she also has another song earlier in the movie. And you're just like, oh, wow, Megan can sing. <laughs> and then it's also just a lot of these moments. The human characters will say something. There's just a lingering shot of, like, Megan firing off, like, this, like, side eye. This, like, yes! side eye... <laughs> That is a very Caucasian girl side eye that you would only feel like from it. Like, it's like a preteen girl side eye. It's like a Michaela Maroney circa the Olympics a few years ago. Kind of just like. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. And it's just a very campy moment. And that's that tracks through the entire movie, that kind of sensibility. And then, like, the protagonist or one of the protagonists, Gemma, is this woman that just doesn't want to be a parent. And she's a, she's basically a tech bro. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like, she, she doesn't know how to take care of a kid. She doesn't, she, all she wants to do is robotics. Uh, she's, <laughs> she, she collects, uh, little, like, little Funko Pop, like, kaiju toys that she yeah. doesn't want anyone to touch. She's very particular about, like, who's in her home and she just a very it's a very tech bro character that's kind of placed into what i think traditionally you're just like oh it's it's like a 30 year old woman she should want to be a parent like those are like the norms for her but it's like no like she absolutely does not want to take care (laughs) of this orphan her orphan niece and it's like she's she doesn't want to babysit no. Yeah. <laughs> she, 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 I don't even think she wants to babysit. She wants to come over for like an hour. Yeah. And then like be like, okay, I'm going to go back to my real life. Exactly. Now. Exactly. So I think there's a lot of like sensibilities there. But I also like I, I don't want to say that this is just a queer movie, but it resonates with the community for a reason. All right. All right. Alex and I are getting more into Megan. But first, we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Thinking about Megan being this like 
cute little doll. Mm-hmm. You, well, I mean, she's a big doll, but she's little for yeah. a being. There's this idea in review, and also in in the earlier interview that you did with the horror expert, that Megan's beauty is a subversion. You call her um, in your review a pretty murder doll, mm-hmm. and. She is like the picture of like white westernized beauty and innocence, pale skin, blue eyes, long blonde hair. There's a moment in the film where they're like very intentional even about picking out the hair. She also has sunglasses. Why does she have sunglasses? I'm like, girl, what what does she need to protect her eyes from? (laughs) She doesn't have real redness. What's going on? What's happening? I mean, she's a baddie, but it's also like, why does she need like a cute coat? That reminds me of something else that, that came up in the conversation that you had with a queer horror expert. Yeah. The idea of the final girl in horror films, you know, like the like right. the virginal, like very straight, typically mostly white girl that makes it to the very end of the film, like who vanquishes the killer or at least escapes the killer, unlike everybody mm-hmm. else. And in that conversation, you discuss like the dichotomy between like the final girl and the villain. It's interesting because the villain in this film <laughs> looks like the final, it's like a baby robot version of the final yeah. girl. In the movie, it's, you can pick Megan's outfits, yes. right? Like you can pick Megan's skin colors. She comes in six different skin colors or, and then like has four different hairstyles. But like the, the one that they pick, like mm-hmm. I think very deliberately is like the one that's supposed to appeal to all the people and be the prototype. It's like this very pretty, she looks like she went to private school. <laughs> she looks like she went to private school in the Northeast. She looks like Regina George. Yeah. <laughs> She does. Looks like a baby Regina George. I mean, this is the whole beauty of like horror movies is that it it's such like weird circumstances and there's so much like weird rules about them that it's fun to subvert mm-hmm. them. And it's also like the horror movies themselves were doing subverting, were like trying to like be twisted and do this weird stuff and like have these weird commentaries. This is what makes Scream so good, right? Mm-hmm. Their scream is always like there's a certain rules of like who makes it to the very end? Who gets killed? What happens? And it's like, you can't have sex. You can't drink drinking. You can't participate in the stuff that would like make you not a wholesome person, not a wholesome teen. <laughs> and so, yeah, what you're seeing in more modern horror is like some versions of that. And you're seeing some twists. I think in Megan, also, like if you compare her to other dolls, if you look at Annabelle from the Conjuring movies, basically she looks demented. Oh, she yeah. She looks like she's rotting. She looks like she smells bad. When you see like an ugly appearance of something, of like a monster, there's this expectation that they're supposed to be scary. When you have something pretty and soft and supposed to be beautiful, like Megan, I mean, I think that's what kind of gives you the spectacle of it. Like, you're just like, oh, that's kind of good that they're making this very docile looking doll <laughs> uh, run on all fours, look completely feral and do mean murderous things. Like, I loved that when she ran Yeah, all like fours. I think that's where there's a little bit of fun. She's a singer, actress, dancer, a triple threat. It's triple threat. <laughs> You know, something else that stood out to me is that Megan is an AI machine and yeah. she represents the AI underclass in revolt. Well, it's it's also funny because she kind of gets accidentally like Gemma like, is basically like, oh, I created one of these in college. I'm just going to make like I accidentally made the most powerful AI on the face of this earth. <laughs> right. Like I've used chat GPT. <laughs> yeah. Megan is kind of like the pinnacle of like this machine to which like, you know, big tech people can can outsource a lot of their everyday activities from getting groceries and scheduling meetings to literally raising a child, which is not an easy thing to do and requires like more nuance than coding. Um, But that's kind of, you know, the point that it gets to in the film. You know, the past few months we've seen other films like Knives Out to take on these these Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley-esque aspirations. What do you think that says about our changing views on the ethics of advanced tech? I mean, I think it's like late stage capitalism. Everyone's kind of aware of it now, right? Mm. (laughs) Like One of the themes in the movie is just basically like there is a capitalist motivation to basically distract your kids. Gemma's a toy inventor and she basically gets kids addicted to these toys. And these toys are pro, you can play with them on your iPad or on your phone. And if you've looked at movies of late, like, yeah, there's definitely been this kind of, I guess, skepticism and kind of just like this weariness of tech. Obviously, Megan could be read as like, hey, yeah, look at like what happens with like technocrats and I guess uh, 
we will outsource parenting to robots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready. I mean, I don't I don't have any there is nothing there's no fiber in my body to ever like want to take care of a child. I just was not built that way. I guess I'm like Gemma. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, maybe to be honest, that sounds like if I didn't have to take care of a kid, but still like hang out with it. <laughs> Like, provided that the kid had good vibes, I'd be into it. <laughs> but I, I do think that there's an interesting idea of, like, parenting and, like, who, what the pressure we put on parents. How we think about women, too, and when it yes. comes to parenthood. And, again, it's not that deep of a movie, but it kind of hits a lot of these very popular topics. Well, you know, I mean, I guess Megan came in and was, like, something of a... Mary Poppins of some sort. <laughs> and, she, and she greased the wheels. You know, here we are, post-Megan, post-Megan world. It's her world. We're just living in it. The internet loved Megan before they knew her. But after seeing the film, and now that, like, you know, a good amount of the internet has seen the film because the film's doing really well at the box office, the sequel's already in the works. We started off this conversation talking about Megan. Basically, you know, she's the internet's sweetheart. In a post-Megan society, is Megan still that girl? Oh, absolutely. There are people rooting for Megan, right? Like, people are like, Megan innocent. Megan didn't do anything wrong. (laughs) Free Megan. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, did she do anything wrong? I don't, I mean, maybe. Murder is probably bad. But (laughs) it's also like the whole camp aspect of Megan. Horror lets us play around with a lot of like, just silly ideas. And Mm. the only thing scarier than Megan would be like a teenage Megan, right? At this point, if she comes back and she's teenage, could you imagine? No, she'd be unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. This is a highlight of my week. I cannot wait. I just can't wait to bring this to people. Megan for everyone. Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking to me about, honestly, what is my favorite topic right now? Oh my God, like any time. That was Alex Abad Santos, friend of this podcast and a writer for Vox.com. This episode was produced by Alexis Williams and Barton Girdwood. It was edited by Jessica Placek. I'm Brittany Luce, and we'll be back on Friday with another episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. Talk soon.